Hi, welcome back to the south of France and to the eighth of our spectacular walks from the Negresco Hotel in Nice all the way to the Chapelle Saint Hospice on Saint Jean Cap Ferrat. Today our walk takes us from here, Villa Les Cedres on Cap Ferrat, down to Plage de Passable along a fantastic coastal path right the way to the lighthouse of Saint Jean. Along the way, we're gonna look at the incredible villa the King of Belgium bought for his 16-year-old lover. We're gonna find out which era-defining movie was shot on Plage de Passable. And we're gonna find out what Somerset Maugham got up to in his 40 years on Saint Jean Cap Ferrat. So pull up your pants, let's get going. So our journey begins here at Villa Les Cedres. Now, Villa Les Cedres, as it says on the sign, is the ancien residence of King Leopold II. It is probably the most spectacular villa on the entire peninsula. In fact, it may well be one of the most spectacular villas in the whole of the world. Now, Villa Le Cedre was built in 1830. It was actually originally built by a, uh, a rich uh, Jewish carpet merchant family in Nice. Uh, and I think in about 1850, it was bought by the mayor of Villefranche and expanded. But it was when King Leopold of Belgium bought it in about 1904, 1905, that everything changed. Because of course, Leopold came here on holiday. He fell in love with Saint Jean and Saint Jean Cap Ferrat, which at that point was just a little promontory of olive groves and fishermen and a very sort of rural setup. Uh, he saw this house, he bought it, and he then proceeded to hoover up an awful lot of other real estate. In fact, he bought so much of it that he started to do it under a pseudonym so that uh, people didn't think, oh, hang on, it's, uh, it's King Leopold, we'll, um, we'll up the price. But this house is quite incredible. It is, I think, 18,000 square meters. It has 14 hectares of garden. In fact, it has one of, if not the largest, private botanical garden in the world. Anyway, let's now begin our journey because we've got quite a long way to go today and it is a truly spectacular walk along the coast with incredible views, both on this side of Saint Jean Cap Ferrat and the bottom of King Leopold's old garden and uh, across the bay to Villefranche where Villefranche tumbles down the mountain into the sea, as Mr. Cocteau said. He said something about everything, have you noticed? got a handy little map here showing you where we're going and uh, we're now heading down the Chemin de Passable down to the Plage de Passable here and then we're going to go all the way along this coastal walk right down here follow my finger down to the lighthouse where all kinds of sin happens Uh, I don't know if you can see this wall to the left hand side of me. These are all his gardens. Uh, there are, as I say, 40 hectares, I think it is, uh, uh, of uh, land, and it stretches right down to the Plage de Passable, where we're headed down this road now. See just over here, even more of the gardens. Um, I have to say this little bit looks in a little bit of a state um, because nobody really goes in there. It's so private and I guess the guy who owns it is very private. Um, nobody really knows what is happening with the gardens, um, whether they are being maintained in their past state or whether uh, they're all gonna be altered along with the villa itself. Because, of course, that's the sad thing about uh, Saint-Jean-Cap-Ferrat. 
is however beautiful it is, it remains in an almost perpetual state of rebuilding. Uh, the trucks never stop rolling, particularly uh, this time of year, uh, as a succession of new and even wealthier people buy the villas and, of course, want to put their mark on them or they get divorced and the wife wants a different kitchen or the boyfriend wants a different greenhouse. Incidentally, Les Cedra, you know, it's got 24 greenhouses. Um, more than B&Q. So when you get to the bottom of these stairs, you are at Plage de Passable. But before we go and check out this wonderful, wonderful beach here, um, I just want to take you along the road here to see uh, the gates of a villa called Villa Radiana. Because Villa Radiana has a pretty sensational story behind it. So these are the gates to the incredible La Radiana. And yet again, you've got a sign up there saying, uh, Pavilion Edife e Habite par uh, King Leopold II, King of the Belgium. But in truth, it wasn't the king who lived here. It was the king's lover, a woman called Blanche Delacroix, who was, when King Leopold met her, by all accounts, working as a 16-year-old prostitute. But Leopold was mad for her. His own marriage, I think, had become a sort of, uh, uh, a bit of a sham. Uh, and he began a long, long affair, which lasted right to the end of his life with Blanche Delacroix. But of course, he couldn't ever be seen in public with her directly. So he was up there in Villa Le Cedre. This villa, which was originally built as the game house, I think, to Villa Le Cedre, is where he installed her. And apparently he would sneak down the passage that we just came down of a night with a lantern, with his specially ironed beard, because he used to iron his beard. Because apparently, this is true, I've heard, uh, he didn't like to kiss her with his long beard with because it would it would have sort of dew in it and damp and it'd be unpleasant. So um, he, he kept his beard very well ironed and he would come down here with a lantern to see his lover. And every day the gardener would be ordered, or one of the gardeners would be ordered to bring her some fresh flowers. But by all accounts, it was a rather lonely existence for her because when she went to dine out with the king, well, she could dine in the same restaurant. She could even dine at the same time, but she certainly couldn't dine at the same table. Similarly, when they went to the theater or the opera, they were there together, but they were never together. So let's head down now to the wonderful Plage de Passable, which is right alongside Villa Radiana. Uh, and I think is one of the most beautiful beaches on the, the whole of saint jean cap -Ferrand. There are some fantastic ones, but this one just has something magical about it. Not least because it's got incredible views of Villefranche. If we head down these steps onto the beach, we can then join the Sentier Littoral and head round the coastline. So this is the fantastic Plage de Passable and uh, it's very quiet today and rather lovely. But uh, just a few hardcore tanners and swimmers over here. Um, but people do swim from here most of the year. It's a great place to come for a picnic. Uh, not least because uh, it gets the sun right until the end of the day. Now, I've often wondered why Plage de Passable was called Plage de Passable. And this morning, Mr. Boo came up with a theory. He thinks it's called Plage de Passable because it is a beach 
without sand. Pa de sable. There's certainly a lot of gravel though. There's an incredible calm about this beach. I don't know why. I mean, it can get very busy in summer and this bit over here is uh, is in summertime a very uh, expensive, well, quite expensive private beach. Um, but there is something about the atmosphere here. We, we came swimming here during lockdown and uh, it's a magical place. Plage de Passable featured in, uh, well, in two ways in that iconic film To Catch a Thief because uh, the Hitchcock director movie, some of it was shot, I think, in Villa Radiana. And there is also a famous scene in which uh, the protagonist is almost caught by a waiter, I think called Foussard, and he grabs him in a chokehold and he throws him over a wall. And I'm pretty sure that the wall he threw him over is the one behind me. And of course, it's amazing how To Catch a Thief, uh, a film from so long ago, still has such significance down here because of course it was on that film that uh, uh, Princess Grace, or as she was then, Grace Kelly, was to meet Prince Rainier. She was to marry Prince Rainier. That was to change the course of the history of Monaco, Monte Carlo. It was the beginning of the Renaissance for Monaco, Monte Carlo. And of course, she lent an awful lot of glamour to down here. She was a huge fan of this area. Uh, and particularly, I think, loved Villefranche and loved the view uh, across the bay of Villefranche. Uh, and that's why when she died, the memorial to her is just uh, as you drive into Villefranche on the right between Nice and, uh, and Villefranche. And uh, lots of people think that's where the car went, you know, straight over the cliff. Well, it's a good story, but it's not true. She actually went over the cliff face much, uh, much closer to La Turbie. Bit of old anchor here, look. <laughs> oh, I'm covered in rust now. Anyway, let's carry along here, along the Sontier Littoral, because we've got some spectacular views up ahead of us. And of course, cruise ships and, uh, well, shipping in general, a huge part of the history of the Bay of Villefranche, cruise ships which have been absent for, well, nigh on two years. But now they're back and they're back big time. And uh, they're one of the things that, well, they split the camps. Those who, uh, those who earn their living here, they bring money to the town. But I guess for those who live here and don't have to earn their money from the cruise ships, well, maybe they're not so keen. What do you think? Do we like the cruise ships? You know what I'm going to say. Leave me a comment below. But I'm genuinely interested because I think it is one of the, um, it's one of those issues that divides Villefranche particularly, um, and uh, it's it's a tricky one, isn't it? Venice is facing exactly the same question: how many is too many um, for the environment and just for the lifestyle of people who live here? Because you know there can be days when there are three cruise ships in at once and 10,000 people disembark into Villefranche. It's quite a lot of people and uh, a lot of them are often heading to Monaco. In fact, I once got stopped and asked by somebody, they said, which way is the casino? I said, there isn't a casino in Villefranche. Well, there is, but it's a, a supermarket on Rue Palou. Just like that, as if by magic, as they used to say on Mr. Ben, the shopkeeper appeared. And you're on the Sentier Littoral. And it's amazing, once you get down here, suddenly it, this becomes very, very timeless. I mean, you read about uh, uh, the great philosopher Nietzsche 
uh, who came down here, I think largely to cope with his depression in, in, in many ways. And he loved nothing more than to take these paths around the cap. Uh, and this is, you know, 100, 120, 130 years ago. These paths go right back and uh, they're as popular today as they have ever been because the views are just sensational. Come along this path you'll spot these little sets of steps down these are fantastic if you uh, if you come and bring a picnic or you want to go and do some swimming you can just scuttle down here and dive in just make sure you keep clear of the sharks i mean the sharks who live on cap for are not the sharks in the water obviously no sharks a few jellyfish les meduse you know there's an app for jellyfish now because people do get stung quite a lot here. It doesn't kill people, but it's, 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 it could spoil your afternoon if you get a, a friend of mine got it in the, well, we won't go into it. But uh, there's an app, Medusa spotting app. Check it out. you get the most incredible view right the way to Nice Airport and then on to the Cap d'Antibe and beyond that you can just see the mountains heading towards Cannes. Fishermen still go out every day from Villefranche and there's a little fish stall in the town. become very popular this hasn't it when i first came here you never saw anybody do it you had to go to thailand to see this now it's everywhere what is it tai chi yoga praying to win the lottery who knows passes the time you can see just on here just how the water now is beginning to go azure the coat d'azur Always makes me giggle because you uh, you think about the the phrase Cote d'Azur, which is so synonymous with down here, and you sort of think, oh, it must be a French expression. It must be something that goes right back in history. It really isn't. It's one of those terms that were uh, invented by well, I guess people like me who uh, did tour guides, things like that. Maybe I should invent some. Maybe I should call this. Uh, what could I call? Oh, I know. Flat cap for at. Because, you know, when I'm here, it goes a bit Yorkshire, doesn't it? Flat Cap Farrar, do you think people that come to Flat Cap Farrar, do you think, do you think um, my American subscribers, who are growing in number and who I love dearly, do you think they'd understand Il Climor Bartat? I'm not sure. Not everything translates, does it? Not everything's global. That's the problem. Anyway, hope you're enjoying uh, watching the channel, all my American friends, and uh, thank you for being as supportive as you are and uh, for buying me coffees occasionally. And it's interesting, as you walk around here, as I say, and you, you sort of catch glimpses of the big villas and you catch glimpses of their fantastic gardens, to think how the nature of the people who have inhabited uh, saint jean cap Fra has changed over the last 130 years. Um, somebody once said, rather ungenerously, that the, uh, the south of France 
was a dirty old whore who'd show anyone their knickers. Now, I think that's a bit cruel because in the end, a place that depends on tourism has to, uh, well, as they say in showbiz, we that live to please must please to live. But uh, it's certainly changed. However, during all that period, there has probably been no more famous resident than the great English writer, Somerset Maugham. Now, Somerset Maugham has kind of fallen out of fashion a little bit, but to put him in perspective, he was at one stage the highest paid writer in the world. And uh, uh, he was also an incredibly successful playwright. At one stage, I think he had five plays running concurrently in the West End of London. Um, and in about 1926, he settled here with his boyfriend, Gerald Haxton. Now, at the time, he was going through a bit of a messy divorce from his wife, Siri, who was an interior designer who became quite famous for sort of inventing the, the white look, the, the all-white room. If you want to know where that comes from, it's Siri Morn, I think. Um, but anyway, uh, Somerset Morn comes here and he buys a villa called La Moresque. Now, part of the reason they came is because Haxton had been caught in flagrante in a hotel room with another man. Now, obviously these days that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't cause a fuss unless that other man happened to be Boris Johnson, obviously. But um, uh, in those days, of course, it was, uh, you know, we were still in the shadow of Oscar Wilde, etc. And so they fled England and they came here and I think um, Maugham paid about £16,000, which was quite a lot of money then, for La Moresque. Now, La Moresque was, <laughs> at the time, a villa that, you guessed it, had been owned by King Leopold. But do you know who King Leopold had put in La Moresque? It wasn't his lover, it wasn't his 16-year-old lover, it was his confessor. So he really did have a full team down here. <laughs> his magicians, his confessor, his concubine, they were all here and he put them all in these separate houses. Uh, um, and that's why actually Villa Moresque is so Moorish, because his confessor, uh, I think, was, was of Algerian or somewhere in that area origin. Uh, and the villa, which had originally been, I think, quite plain, uh, boxy, was turned into this sort of uh, Moorish fantasy. Well, when Maugham bought it, he transformed it even further. And of course, it was to become his home for 40 years. And it became inextricably linked with his public image. Um, he conducted countless interviews from here. There's a fantastically stiff uh, interview on sort of movie tone news where he talks about his writer's life uh, down here on the south of France. But for a very long time, Maugham had a great time here in the south. Uh, Haxton was, um, was quite a player. He was a big drinker, he was a very big gambler, and he liked quite a lot of sex. But Maugham, I think, liked even more sex. And Haxton would procure young sailors for him in Villefranche uh, and, uh, and the surrounding area. Um, and despite the fact that Maugham looked like this, the epitome of a sort of Edwardian gentleman, often pictured with a pipe and a, and a cane. Um, it was a very loose life, which I think if the truth had emerged, uh, certainly in Britain would have caused him huge amounts of problems. But of course, as Oscar Wilde did when he fled to France, uh, Maugham was to some extent reliant on the fact that attitudes round here were much more, uh, shall we say, Laissez faire. But yeah, Maugham and Haxton lived here right up until um, the outbreak of World War II. Uh, and there is an incredible story concerning Maugham and what happened because the war has begun. I think the Germans have just, or the Nazis have just invaded the lowlands and the Italians have arrived here uh, because the Germans didn't occupy here right until the end of the war. They let the Italians do it. And the British government issues a warning to its citizens 
that they better get out because uh, basically the Brits will be interned. Somerset Maugham cannot face this and so he makes the decision to leave his precious Moresque. Now Haxton, who has an American passport, decides that he will remain a little longer and see how things pan out. So it is Haxton who drives Somerset Maugham from this grand villa on saint jean cap ferrat all the way to Cannes, where I think he installs him in the Carlton Hotel to await the next day a coal boat to take him to Gibraltar. And that night in, in the Carlton, the hotel is full of wildly rich, wildly drunk British people partying like it's the last night of the world because it was, because in some senses they were leaving behind this incredibly privileged life and they were going to get on a coal boat, sleep on the floor and that is what happened to Maugham and that is what happened to all those other people. Uh, I think seven of them died on the journey um, and when they finally made it to Gibraltar, I think a week, eight days later, after a hideous uh, sea crossing, Gibraltar turned them away. It decided it already had too many um, refugees. And so the boat carried on all the way to Liverpool. And from Liverpool, Maugham was able to get back into London and uh, he escaped the Nazis. But sadly, during that period, Haxton dies. Uh, I think he dies very quickly of pleurisy. I think uh, to some extent Somerset Maugham can see it coming because of his um, <coughs> habits and lifestyle. Um, and Maugham is distraught. He has to face in 1946 the prospect of coming back here to La Moresque where, as he said, the house is going to be full of ghosts. Um, but he does come back and quite quickly he installs a man called Alan Searle who he I think had been sort of having a semi-open affair with for about 10 years uh, and he installs Searle in the house as his uh, lover stroke valet stroke uh, bottle washer uh, and they live out an incredible life here because every star in the world who came anywhere near the south of France came to the villa of Somerset Maugham and not just the famous actors but uh, the politicians of the day Winston Churchill the press magnates like Lord Beaverbrook um, it was like a who's who but um, Somerset wasn't uh, wasn't always the um, let's say uh, well he could get a bit wound up by his guests I think probably because they were too many of them came. In fact, at some stages, he didn't even know it was down the dining table. Um, and famously, one guy turned up and uh, he, um, he was talking about, uh, telling a sort of anecdote uh, about a man who stuttered. Now, he must have forgotten that Somerset Maugham himself famously stuttered. And uh, when he'd finished telling this hilarious stutter anecdote, Somerset Maugham looked across the room at him and said well I'm going to bed now I imagine I'll be asleep when you leave in the morning goodbye I think the guy was meant to have been there for another 10 days Let's carry on round here now and head towards the wonderful lighthouse of Saint Jean where we're going to end our walk today and I'm going to tell you all about not just the lighthouse but um, about Bono and, um, and Sherry Blair because well they did something quite strange together by the lighthouse. It's true. I wouldn't lie. And indeed, 
there she is, or he is. It's probably a he, isn't it? A lighthouse with a, you know, phallic connotations. But why not? I'm going to call it a she. I think it's a she. It's interesting, there's been a lighthouse here since, well, there was originally a fire tower here, I think in the 16th century, but there's been a lighthouse here since 1732. But this one has only existed since, uh, well, it's post-war, because I think in 1944, there was a Nazi bombardment and, uh, and the old one was wrecked. see for the kids maybe not the kids maybe for older adults with their pink flamingo I think it's highly symbolic that pink flamingo because this area to the right of me here is um, uh, is the sort of gay nudist rocks really um, I don't think it's exclusively gay I mean you don't have to have a pass to go in or anything they don't test you um, but uh, there's certainly um, Quite a bit of nude bathing goes on here in, well, on warmer afternoons. I can't see anyone here right now. But, you know, I shall thoroughly check it out just so uh, I keep you up to date. And there you go, the signage says Tour de la Presqu'île. That means in French, almost an island. It's a very poetic way of saying a peninsula. So Saint Jean Cap Ferrar is almost an island. And that fountain behind me is the reason earlier I said I was going to tell you something about um, Mr. Bono and Miss Sherry Blair. Well, Mr. Bono and Miss Sherry Blair, or Mrs. Sherry Blair, um, actually unveiled that fountain because it's part of the Coexist charity that I think uh, Mr Bono is a part of and of course Mr Bono just happens to have a, a very large villa just along the coast here on, uh, on the beach in Ayres and uh, I think the press were very cynical about Miss Blair coming out or Mrs Blair coming out for this uh, unveiling. I think some of them thought she was possibly here for a holiday. Now I would never be so cynical as to suggest anything like that. But it's actually very handy, the water's good, and uh, one time Halloween rolled in some dog poo up there, and it was very handy to wash her down. Has this guy got very pert buttocks? With the sun setting behind us, that brings us to the end of this week's walk. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the like button. Uh, it makes a huge difference to the algorithm. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to receive notifications. I'll see you on the next spectacular walk, hopefully in a week's time. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.